in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. It is a great honor to speak to you today. I was asked to talk about two topics that relate to the Heidelberg Catechism. Part one, my lecture, I will give you an overview over the history of the Heidelberg Catechism. And in the second part of the lecture, I will talk about the purpose of the Heidelberg Catechism. But first of all, let me give greetings from our confessing evangelical reform congregation in Gießen. It was a great joy for us to welcome some of your young people in our small reformed church a couple of weeks ago. One of the foundations that is common to the Protestant Reformed churches and to the confessing evangelical Reformed church is the Heidelberg Catechism. Our church, as well as your churches, hold to it as a binding confession of faith and use it as the basis for the instruction in the churches. We are both convinced that the Heidelberg Catechism explains the Gospel in a way that is faithful to the Holy Scriptures, that is, to the infallible, inerrant Word of God. <laughs> and thus, it becomes, that, thus it becomes clear that the Heidelberg Catechism <coughs> is not only the histor of historical value, no, it has a great impact on many people in our days. But, as I already pointed out, I am not going to speak about the role of the Heidelberg Catechism in the 21st century. Instead, I will speak about the historical context in which the Heidelberg Catechism was written. In addition to that, we want to try to understand for which purpose the Catechism was authored. So let us start with part one, the history of the Heidelberg Catechism. And 1.1, the political situation 450 years ago. The name of this confession of faith includes the term Heidelberg. This is due to the fact that the Catechism was written in the city of Heidelberg. It was also printed there for the first time. 450 years ago, Heidelberg was the capital of a territory within the German Empire. And this territory was called Electorate Palatinate. <coughs> the Heidelberg Catechism was printed there to be the binding doctrinal basis for the Church of the Palatinate. The Heidelberg Catechism was supposed to be the confessional basis for what the Germans call Landeskirche. Landeskirche literally would be state church. But what is a Landeskirche, a state church? You all live in a country where the state and the church are separated from one another according to the Constitution. And that means that the government is not allowed to interfere in church affairs. But imagine one day the governor of Michigan would give the order that all the people in Michigan have to hold to the same confession of faith. And this confession of faith should be taught to all the people who live here should be binding not only for the churches, but also for the schools. 
this would be a rather strange scenario. But it helps us to understand the relationship between the church and the government as it was 450 years ago. In fact, in all of Europe, the government determined more or less everything that was to be taught in the churches and the schools. In those days, the people considered this close link between the church and the state as something normal. They were used to it. In the late classical era, <coughs> during the entire Middle Ages, the worldly rulers claimed their right to intervene in church affairs. They often attended church councils. And after these councils, the decrees gained legal status. It was even common that a ruler presided over such a church council. In the late Middle Ages, the Pope lost power. And in the course of the 14th and 15th century, also the Emperor of the German Empire became weaker and weaker. And this led to an increase in the power of the rulers over the many territories within the German Empire. These rulers were called princes. This was the situation of Central Europe at the dawn of the Reformation. From 1519, Charles V was the emperor in the German Empire. But he did not rule over Germany alone, but also over Austria, southern Italy, large parts of Spain and the Spanish territories in Latin America. These territories had been recently discovered at that time, as we all know. But this mighty ruler was confronted with the princes in Germany, who had largely become independent of the emperor during the 15th century. <laughs> And when Charles tried to gain more power and influences, this led to tensions. Because the princes did not want to return something of their power to the emperor. And this problematic situation also shaped the relationship between the emperor and the prince of the Palatinate in the early 1500s. 1.2, the Reformation in Germany. God sent the Reformation into this political conflict. Martin Luther published his 95 theses against indulgences in Wittenberg in the year of 1570. For this, he was put before the Diet of Worms. 1520. It is important to note that Luther had to defend his doctrinal beliefs not in front of church authorities, but in front of the emperor and the princes of the German Empire. After the Diet, Luther was not imprisoned immediately. He was even allowed to flee from Worms. But the emperor placed him under the, an imperial ban. And this meant that anyone could murder Luther without any legal consequences. It was the emperor's intention to eliminate the Reformation. Soon after the Diet of Worms, however, he was at war with the Turks and the French king, Francis I. And that is, the Reformation was able to spread without much opposition in Germany and in other countries. Charles needed the financial and military support of the princes 
especially of his Protestant German princes. And in light of this, he did not want to oppose the Reformation too strongly. By February 1546, Luther had died. Charles V had won the wars. And this gave him time to oppose the Reformation as he had originally intended. In June 1546, the Schmalkaldic War broke out, which was a battle between the Emperor and some Catholic princes on the one side and the Protestant, ter Protestant territories on the other side. And this war ended the following year with a stunning victory for the Emperor and his allies. The defeat was so disastrous that many people thought that the Reformation had failed completely. After the Schmalkaldic War, Charles did everything to re-establish religious unity within the Empire. And this meant that the Protestant churches were to become part of the Roman Catholic Church again. After his victory, as a matter of fact, the emperor was as powerful as he had never been before. But this soon became a problem for the Roman Catholic princes. They realized that they would lose their own power in the long run. And therefore, they pursued alliances with some Protestant princes, who at that time had very little. And the alliance between Catholic and Protestant princes was formed behind the back of the emperor. And this laid, to the, uh, this laid the foundation for the famous Diet of Augsburg in 1555. This is a very important date. The Diet of Augsburg stated that not the emperor but every prince should have authority to decide the confession of his subjects. The result of the Diet of Augsburg was if the prince was Roman Catholic, then his people had to become Roman Catholic, or they had to leave the country instead. Likewise, if a prince was Lutheran, then his people had to adopt his convictions or they had to immigrate into another territory. And this decree was called the Augsburg Settlement. And that is the origin of the Landeskirche or state churches. The authors of the American Constitution were influenced by individualism, which focused on the freedom of conscience. This is the presupposition for religious freedom. And as, you might, and as you might know, this freedom of conscience was prepared by the Reformation. Take, for instance, Luther's famous statement before the Diet of Worms, here I stand, I can do no other. But the breakthrough for the idea of grounding religious freedom on individualism came a century later under such men as Oliver Cromwell <coughs> and John Locke. <coughs> so we can summarize. The Augsburg settlement did not intend religious freedom for the individual, but for the for a territory. 1.3, the beginning of the Reformation in the Palatinate. In this historical context, the Heidelberg Catechism was written. The Heidelberg Catechism was therefore not initiated by theologians 
or pastors, the decision to create a catechism for the churches in the Palatinate was not even made by a synod, but by the prince who was called elector in the Palatinate. From 1559, the elector was Frederick III. Since the second half of the 15th century, Heidelberg was influenced by Renaissance thought. The Renaissance court came from Italy over the Alps and rooted itself very quickly in the Palatinate. A few months after Luther had nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg in October 1517, he traveled to Heidelberg to hold a disputation in the local monastery there in April, in April 1580. Luther did not choose indulgences as the topic for this disputation, but he talked about the depravity of man in this center of humanism. Let me give you some quotes of Luther. He said, true knowledge is not by philosophy. Instead, true knowledge comes by Christ. Even the best works are nothing but sin unto death without fear of and love for God. Another statement. After the fall, free will is nothing but a shell, and as long as man follows his so-called free will, he sins unto death. <coughs> Another statement. <coughs> the one who thinks he can redeem himself by works will accumulate sin after sin. Sin causes the wrath of God. It kills, curses, accuses, and damns everything which is not in Christ. It becomes true. Luther wanted to emphasize the deep depravity of man and Christ being the only salvation for sins. In the following decades, Reformation theology spread through the Palatinate. One year after the Augsburg settlement in 1555, Otto Henry Henry in 1556, became the elector in Heidelberg and officially established the Reformation in his territory. He ruled from 1556 to 1559. The origins of the Heidelberg Catechism 1.4. In 1559, Frederick III, I mentioned him already, became ruler of the Palatinate. His nickname was the Pious. Indeed, he was not only very much interested in theology, but he was also eager to live a life in accordance with the life of God. He became elector in Heidelberg, and there were strong debates on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper between the followers of Luther and those of Zwingli. In 1529, Luther and Zwingli had met in Marburg and had debated question of how Christ is present in the Lord's Supper. Luther insisted on the physical presence of Christ. Zwingli was convinced that Christ is symbolically present. Later, Calvin, Calvin, Calvin taught the spiritual presence of Christ. And the latter position is also defended by the Heidelberg Catechism, I remind you, in the question and answers um, 76, that we read, to eat the crucified body 
and drink the shed blood of Christ is to become more and more united to his sacred body by the Holy, Spirit, Holy Ghost who dwells both in Christ and in us. <coughs> and Frederick III became elector in the Palatinate. He held to the Lutheran position on the Lord's Supper. But during the debates at the University in Heidelberg in the early 1560s, Frederick III became convinced by the Reformation position. Consequently, the Elector called Reformed theologians to important positions. And in those days, men like Caspar Olympianus came to Heidelberg. Sometime later, he was joined by Zacharias Ursinus, who, su who succeeded Olympianus as professor for dogmatics. In addition to that, Frederick also ordered Im images of saints and crosses to be removed. And not only did he consider his actions legal because of the settlement of 1555, but he also thought of himself as a kind of modern Old Testament king, such as Jairi, Hezekiah, or Josiah, who had started a reformation in their respective territories. To establish reformed thinking in his territory, in 1562, he commanded a church order to be erected. The Heidelberg Catechism became part of this new church order. On point five, the writing of the Heidelberg Catechism. As we have seen, it was the elector who, in who initiated the writing of the Heidelberg Catechism. But he did not write the Catechism himself, but asked some Heidelberg theologians to do so. Frederick III tells us that he gave the order to write the Catechism to a council of pastors and theologians. This points us to the fact that a couple of men took part in the writing of the Catechism. But it is very likely that the main work was done by Osinus. Osinus was born in 1534 into a Lutheran family in Silesia. At the age of 15, he moved to Wittenberg to study theology. And during that time, he lived in the house, in the house of Philip Elankter. In those days, both men became good friends. When Osinus had finished his studies in Wittenberg in 1557, he made a journey through the centers of the Reformation. Together with Elankton, he visited the debate in Worms. And after that, he went to cities like Strasbourg, Basel, Zurich, Bern, Lausanne, and Geneva. In Geneva, he also met Calvin. Again, he traveled to Zurich, where he talked to Bullinger and to the Italian Calvinist Peter Martyr Vermigli. This man actually had a large impact on the young Osinus. In 1558, Osinus became a teacher in his hometown, but very soon, he got in, into conflict with several Lutheran ministers due to his view on the Lord's Supper. So in 1560, he left his hometown and went first to Zurich and then to Heidelberg. When he finally authored the Catechism, the science was 26 years old. On point six, the publishing of the Catechism. 
In February 1563, the first edition of the Catechism was published. It only included 128 questions and answers. Question and answer 80 on the papal mass were added in the second edition, edition, which was published sometime later in the same year. In the third edition, the Heidelberg Catechism was divided into 52 long states. All of this happened during the year 1563. In that same year, the Catechism was presented to the congregations of the Palatinate by an introductory sermon series. The church order of the Palatinate, part of which was the Heidelberg Catechism, consisted of 32 articles which governed the church life of the members as well as their private lives. It includes policies for baptism, communion, weddings, funerals, the order of worship, the garments of pastors, public prayers, and church, church discipline. Because the plague broke out in Heidelberg, in the same year, the elector signed the church order in nearby Mosbach in November 1563. And by this signature under the church order, the Heidelberg Catechism gained legal status. 1.7 reactions to the Heidelberg Catechism. From the very beginning, the Heidelberg Catechism evoked various reactions. It was received with great enthusiasm and gratitude by many. When the reformer of Zurich, Heinrich Bullinger, read the Catechism for the first time, he called it the best Catechism ever published. But the Catechism was also resisted by many. Some pastors in the Palatinate were critical of the Catechism simply because they did not want to have a binding document. They had enjoyed the theological pluralism of thought that had existed in the Palatinate for decades. Of course, there was opposition from the Roman Catholic side too. And the Lutherans also authored many polemics against the Heidelberg Catechism. During the Diet of Augsburg of 1566, so not of 1555, two Lutherans, the Duke of Württemberg and the Count of Zweibrücken, accused the electorate Palatinate of not holding to the Augsburg Confession. An emperor Maximilian II demanded that the new church order, together with the Heidelberg Catechism, was to abolish immediately. Otherwise, the Palatinate would stand outside of the Augsburg settlement, and the elector would be subject to an imperial ban. 1.8, the fight for the Heidelberg Catechism in the Palatinate. An overwhelming majority of the princes at the Diet of Augsburg in 1566 turned against Frederick III because of the Heidelberg Yet we know from some reports that Frederick defended the Catechism in such a wise and humble manner that it was finally tolerated by imperial law. In 1576, Frederick III died, and his son, Louis VI, took over the rule over the Palatinate in the same year. And from the very beginning of his reign, he did everything to move the Palatinate back into Lutheranism. He did this by replacing 
They form church order into a Lutheran church order and Lutheran creeds. And thus, the Heidelberg Catechism was basically abolished in the Palatinate. More than 600 teachers and pastors were forced to leave the Palatinate. The entire theological faculty of the university, including Ursinus, was dismissed from their positions. Ursinus was called by another son of Frederick, John Casimir, to serve as a professor at a recently founded reformed seminary the Collegium Casimirianum in nearby Deutschland. The Zionists, the Zionists kept his position until he died there at the age of 49 in 1583. Louis himself died in 1583 after he had, after he had reigned for only seven years. And John Casimir became administ administrative ruler over the Palatinate. And once again, he changed the church order of the territory by re-establishing the reformed convictions of his father. Once again, Lutheran teachers, pastors, and officers were replaced by reformed ones. Many of the theologians who had left Heidelberg to teach at the seminary in Neustadt now returned to the Heidelberg University. In 1585, the Heidelberg Catechism, as well as a Reformed Church Order, were reinstituted, the latter being largely identical with the Church Order of 1563. When the Palatinate was occupied, by Roman Catholic princes during the Thirty Years' War, and Reformed services were forbidden. The Catechism was so rooted in the minds of the people that they held to it in spite of persecution. Or rather, in the midst of all of their suffering, they were held by the doctrine of the Gospel contained in the Heidelberg Catechism. During the age of the Enlightenment, people began thinking they could believe only those biblical doctrines that also appeal to human reason. And thus, the Christian faith was reduced to a general faith in God, to a belief in the immortality of the soul, and some rules for the life marked by virtues. And since then, the Heidelberg Catechism was increasingly being seen as outdated and was slowly forgotten in the Palatinate. 1.9, acceptance and spreading of the Heidelberg Catechism. In spite of the Heidelberg Catechism to and fro in the Palatinate, it was widely distributed and accepted in territories other than the Palatinate. In the last decades of the 16th century, many German territories changed their confession from a Lutheran to a Reformed position. And most of them accepted the church order of the Palatinate and the Heidelberg Catechism. Outside of Germany, the Heidelberg Catechism was adopted by Hungary and in large parts of Switzerland. Since the Palatinate was the first reformed territory within Germany, it became a shelter for many religiously persecuted reformed Christians especially the French Huguenots. More refugees came from the Netherlands, which were attacked by Spain at that time. In the Palatinate, these Dutch people got to know and appreciate the Heidelberg Catechism. Many of them came to the town of Frankenthal. Frankenthal is a city, a 
town in the Palatinate. The leading figure of these people was the pastor of the Dutch Church of Refugees in Frankenthal, Peter Dathin. A lot of reformed teaching was published in Dutch in this, sent, in this city and sent back to the Netherlands from this town. In Frankenthal, the Heidelberg Catechism was also translated into Dutch and printed shortly after its publication. It was the Synod of God in 1618, 1619, where the Heidelberg Catechism was declared to be the unanimously accepted creed of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. When the English delegates arrived home from the Synod, they reported our continental brothers have a booklet whose pages could not be paid with tons of gold. The first English translation was published in 1572, and it is likely that immigrants brought it to North America in the late 16th century. In 1628, the first reformed pastor arrived in New Amsterdam. In 1656, the governor, at that time Peter Stuyvesant, who himself was the son of a reformed pastor, ordered that the word of God should be preached according to the reformed confessions and the church order of the Synod of God. This early edict brought the Heidelberg Catechism officially to America. The Heidelberg Catechism continued to spread in the following years. And this process in America was especially pushed by the immigration of Dutch Reformed Christians under such men as A. van Rauti and H. B. Scotty in the 19th century. Now let us come to the second point, the purpose of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is, what was the purpose of the Heidelberg Catechism? <coughs> well, this question is answered by Frederick III in the preface to the Heidelberg Catechism, where he gives two purposes. The Heidelberg Catechism was to serve the temporal well-being and the eternal salvation of his people. 2.1, for the temporal well-being. In the 60s of the 16th century, the Palatinate was the only territory whose prince was decidedly reformed. And therefore, Frederick III considered it to be of great importance to be clear to the other German territories what the Reformed actually believe. The Heidelberg Catechism was supposed to be that confession. However, it also had an inner function for the Palatinate. Frederick III was convinced that ambiguity in the doc doctrinal beliefs of his people would lead to chaos and the downfall of his territory. The church order to which the Heidelberg Catechism belongs includes the following passage. Quote, the primary pur purpose is to prevent that church and society will decay by sinful human nature. End of quote. Second point. 2.2 for the eternal salvation. As important as the temporal purpose of the Heidelberg Catechism was, the main purpose of the Heidelberg Catechism was and is the eternal salvation of man. The Catechism is about the communication of truth, the truth 
that is indispensable for the eternal salvation of the person instructed. The idea was that the student would answer himself that he confesses his faith through words, but also through deeds. And for the sake of their own salvation, people should learn the truth for the gospel so that they would give testimony, as it is stated at the beginning of the Heidelberg Catechism, that I henceforth live unto him. Somewhere else in question and answer 54, that I am and forever shall remain a living member of Christ's church. <coughs> Within the church order of the Palatinite, the Heidelberg Catechism was placed between the statements about baptism and the Lord's Supper, which signifies its bridging function from sacrament to sacrament. We can distinguish three purposes for the eternal salvation. First of all, it serves as educational purpose. In the preface of the Heidelberg Catechism, Frederick III writes that, quote, our youth may be taught from early on foremost in the pure and strong doctrine of the Holy Gospel and be trained in the real and true knowledge of God. And, and he continues by saying that the Heidelberg Catechism shall serve this purpose. Frederick III wrote in the church order of the Platinate, quote, as the children of Israel were circumcised and, and they were old enough to understand, were taught the covenant of God and the signs of that covenant, so our children should be taught in the true Christian faith and repentance after they have received baptism. And thus, the instruction was about God's covenant. This was the purpose. Frederick III saw the huge lack of knowledge of God's word and the lack of upright Christian living. To counter this lack, a reading from the Heidelberg Catechism in the morning service was introduced. And during, the after, and during the afternoon service, the Catechism served as the basis for the sermon. The letter was something entirely unique at that time, that you can preach out of the, of, out of the Catechism. The fact that the Heidelberg Catechism was used for preaching was the reason for dividing its 129 questions into 52 sections, Lord's Days, in the third edition. <coughs> Unique is also the Catechism's richness of scripture quotes, which shows that the Catechism is rooted in scripture and that it is best understood as a means to understand God's word and to live according to it. As question and answer 98 state, God wants to teach his people by the, by the proclamation of his word. This instruction should take place not only in churches, but also in schools. The exact title of the Heidelberg Catechism is, in translation, Catechism or Christian Instruction According to the Usages of Churches and Schools of the Electorate Latin. It is, of course, primarily the parents' duty to teach to their children the content of the Gospel with the help of the Heidelberg Catechism. As it is stated in the preface, 
the Heidelberg Catechism is also intended as a teaching pattern for teachers, less able teachers were supposed to use it as a guide. The Heidelberg Catechism wants to teach healthy doctrine that heals its heroes. The educational intention of the Heidelberg Catechism is not mere transfer of information. It is about being gripped personally by the gospel and its mighty truths. And this is why the Heidelberg Catechism uses personal forms such as thy, mine, or I, for instance, what is thy only comfort in life and death, that I belong to my Savior with body and soul. Another example is the answer to question 26. I believe that the Eternal Father is my God and my Father. The Church's purpose in teaching the Confessions is that their content will become a personal confession. It must become my confession. It is also important to note that as much as the Heidelberg Catechism keeps the simple reader in mind, it is not solely a children's book. One never goes out of it. The Heidelberg Catechism wants to be a book for the church that, as the Bible, is meant for lifelong and active use. There's a close link between this educational purpose and another purpose, the apologetical purpose. The Heidelberg Catechism is about teaching what is right and what is not right. It shows that the Christian must test the spirits and that one may say no to false teaching. Right from the start of church history, the purpose of dogmas, confessions and catechisms was to reject false <coughs> teachings. This is also true of the Heidelberg Catechism. Due to the historical context, we find that it draws line, lines against Catholic, Catholicism. From 1545 onwards, with interruptions, the Roman Catholic Church held the Council in Trent, which aimed to attack Reformation doctrine. When the Roman Catholic pamphlets made their way to the Palatinate, it became a pastoral necessity to speak a clarifying word into the situation. In late 1562, the Council of Trent resolved the doctrine of the Papal Mass. The leadership in the Palatinate reacted by inserting the famous question and answer 80 into the second edition of the Heidelberg Catechism which states that the papal mass is an accursed idolatry. This is probably the best known anti-Catholic statement, but it is not the only one. The Catechism speaks out against the veneration of saints, question and answer 30, against justification by works, question and answer 62 to 64, against baptismal regeneration, question and answers 72, against prayer to the saints, question and answer 94, and against iconoculism in question and answer 97 and 98. Furthermore, it also shows the difference between the Reformed faith and the beliefs of the Anabaptists. Of course, the most prominent issue that the Catechism addresses in this context is the question of infant baptism, question and answer 74. Another difference between the Catechism and Anabaptist theology is the permission to take an oath in certain situations, 
question and answer 101 and the emphasis on submit, submitting to the government which the Heidelberg Catechism derives from the fifth commandment, question and answer 104. And finally, the Catechism opposes Lutheranism and this mainly concerns the denial of the Lutheran doctrine of the ubiquity of the human nature of Christ. This doctrine, in turn, formed the basis for the Lutheran understanding of the Lord's Supper. By dealing with Christ's ascension, the Lutheran doctrine of ubiquity is refuted in question and answer 57. Now there's a third purpose of the Heidelberg Catechism for our eternal salvation. And this I call the doxological purpose. Educational, apologetic, and now doxological. One of the main callings of the Church of Jesus Christ is true worship of the triune God. And therefore, the confessions also have a doxological function. But I want to remind us that the last question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism. My prayer is more assuredly heard of God than I feel in my heart that I desire these things of him. And if we can say this, if we confess this, we truly praise God who has become our Father through Jesus Christ. At last one confession. Is this purpose fulfilled by the Heidelberg Catechism? Does the Heidelberg Catechism fulfill the purpose for which it was written? Does the Heidelberg Catechism clearly proclaim the Reformed faith? Did it support the unity of faith on the basis of truth in the Palatinate? Were people instructed by the Heidelberg Catechism in such a way that they were personally able to believe and to bear witness to their faith. Due to the lack of time, I cannot talk in detail about those questions. But I want to answer them with a short and emphatic yes. There is another question that is closely connected to these topics. A question that I want to shortly address as a kind of bridge to our next topic. Although yet we have talked a lot about Frederick III as the, the initiator of the Heidelberg Catechism, and we have talked a lot about the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism, what about the ordinary people? To answer this question, it is important to look at the lives of the ordinary people in the 16th century. For the average citizen living in the Palatinate meant a lot of insecurities and struggles. I want to point you to the following facts. Firstly, wars and rumors of them. In those days, there were Turkish troops threatening the empire again. Everyone knew if there were an invasion, this would, would cause death, destructions, and miseries. The empire was not well equipped for such an invasion. The emperor and the princess were not always on the same page, and their meetings were marked by severe conflicts. Secondly, there were social and economic changes in these years. In those years, many changes were happening. They were, they were due to the fact that the importance of money grew enormously, and thus the gap between the rich and the poor 
became larger and larger. Many people fled from the countryside into the towns. And as a result, many people lost their social context and large family clans increasingly <coughs> dissolved. Thirdly, problematic spiritual influences. Although the practice of witch trials had decreased decisively, in 1562, the elector had to prohibit superstition, astrology, and soothsaying explicitly. In addition to that, the traditional authorities lost power among the ordinary people. This de development was prepared by the Renaissance. When the reformers pointed out the problematic state of the church, the normal people became unsettled. They kept asking themselves, if the church is a mess, where can I find hope? The fourth thing, natural catastrophes and diseases. Heidelberg is located in a beautiful area, but also in an area where a lot of earthquakes happen. In the 16th century, there were a lot more earthquakes in the Heidelberg area than in the centuries before. Destruction and human suffering were the result of this. And as I already mentioned, the plague came to Heidelberg just in the year the Catechism was published. The ordinary citizen of Heidelberg could not simply move somewhere else. In addition to that, there was a climate change in Central Europe in the middle of the 16th century, and which caused a lot of bad harvests. As a result, the elector prohibited the celebration of feasts. Of feasts. This was not due to the fact that there were all Calvinists who were not allowed to celebrate, but the reason was a serious lack of food. The Heidelberg Catechism deals with catastrophes like that. Let's think, let's think of question and answer 27. The Almighty God upholds and governs heaven and earth and all creatures so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yeah, and all things come not by chance, <coughs> but by his fatherly hand. For the ordinary people, those years were marked by insecurity and desolation. The people had to realize in this situation that they cannot find certainty in this world. But where can I find an anchor? I cannot find assurance, <laughs> comfort for life. Well, it's not my task to answer this question, but this is the talk of Professor Kevin Thank you much for your attention.